I mean, you probably heard recently about all the discussions of whether the large language models like GPT or AGI, is that the first spark of AGI? I think it's pretty exciting what's happening there, but there is a uh, one capability that I am really excited about and that I would say is part of AGI, which is that the model can actually improve itself, that it can improve the learning algorithm and get better and better at some point to the point where it really does not require researchers anymore, but it does the machine learning research. And I've been taking small steps towards this goal uh, yeah, over the past few years, and I want to give you a little bit of a journey um, about uh, this, this um, yeah, process. And uh, if there are any questions throughout the talk, please just jump right in. It can make this a bit more interactive. Okay, now we need, yes, all right. So my research is about meta learning. And if you think about most of meta learning, one could say 99% of meta learning, it really excels in adaptation to unseen but similar tasks. So really learning very quick, quickly from very few examples. So here focusing on some reinforcement learning examples, uh, everyone probably has heard of MAML, which uh, allows for really quick adaptation to new tasks, like in this half cheetah here, running forward or backward, and then just learning that in a few graded steps. Uh, or more um, related to some in-context learning in robotics uh, with, sorry, a bit older now, the robotic hand, where you train it in simulation across many different uh, environments with different phys phys physical uh, constants such that it then can actually adapt to the real robotic hand. And of course, recently, the large language models where we see this in-context learning where you can learn very quickly from few demonstrations. Um, and this is really good for fast adaptation. But there is uh, one kind of meta-learning that I just dubbed general purpose meta-learning, um, which I would say is a bit different because it's about driving the advances in machine learning via meta-learning. Um, so really doing more of the research itself, where one important quality is that we want reusability of the learning algorithm that we find via meta-learning that then can be used across a wide range of tasks. So, so really the process of doing machine learning research where, for example, in RL, we would have um, you know, a learning algorithm trained across all kinds of environments, which you can then just throw on a new, say, robotic control problem like this hopper environment here, and it can then also learn in this environment, even though it's quite different. It implements a general learning algorithm. And RL to me is quite interesting because um, I think there are a lot of open questions there, how to really explore efficiently and then exploit. Um, whereas in supervised learning, um, I think a lot of these questions are maybe a little further uh, where we can just throw back prop on it as we've done uh, previously. But I am investigating both areas. And I would say maybe this general purpose learning is also um, already happening a little bit in large language models to really big task distributions, but we will get to that later. So generally speaking, if the goal is this general purpose meta-learning, um, how do we actually get to this generalization where we get uh, automatically discover learning algorithms that really generalize well? And I think we can put approaches on a spectrum from having a lot of structure all the way to having a very little structure in the learning algorithm or architecture um, um, of, uh, that we're actually applying at, at meta test time. So what do I mean by that? Uh, for example, learn optimizers. If you think about Adam, let's replace Adam with something that is automatically meta-learned. Um, then we already have like some fixed components at meta test time. So in our discovered learning algorithm, like we compute the gradient using backprop and then just meta-learn how to apply that gradient. So we just re replace the Adam component essentially. But how to obtain the gradient is still fixed. It's still human engineered. Um, and then maybe further down is gradient-based um, uh, learning, but with a learned initialization like MAML does it. But we're still relying on a human engineered learning algorithm like backprop or in, in reinforcement learning, say policy gradients that we then apply at meta test time as the learning algorithm. And then further down, there's some work um, that essentially uses learned objective functions, where we learn even more of, about the learning algorithm. And there's some work of mine that we'll describe later all the way to now we get into in-context learning territory where we have black box neural networks that learn the learning algorithm just in the dynamics of the network and we will talk about that as well all the way to completely black box in context learning where we don't have a, 
a lot of the biases that we had in the previous version. Um, and you can think of this like the in-context learning transformers or L squared. And I will talk about these things more. Uh, and there is also another method called GPickle, general purpose in context learning that I will discuss today. So the left end is basically the in-context learning part. So let's first talk about um, this work meta general, which is uh, one of my first works, which really showed um, strong generalization of the meta learned learning algorithms. Um, so basically the inspiration we took here is in reinforcement mm -hmm. learning, we, when we as researchers do, uh, find new learning algorithms, we often express them as sort of surrogate functions, like uh, a human engineer policy gradient, where you have the policy gradient surrogate function, which maps from the rewards and the lot probabilities um, under the policy and maybe a value function to a, a loss, which you then um, use to learn. So let's say you have a policy pi phi, then learning would correspond to this policy gradient surrogate loss differentiated with respect to the parameters of the policy. And then learning corresponds to these gradients, gradient updates. And we can just uh, take this and parameterize it to turn it into a meta-learning um, where the policy gradient objective function is now just a neural network, which with parameters alpha, which maps from the tau, the trajectory of experiences and some function of the policy, like the actions and the value function to some loss. And we just, we basically meta-learn these parameters alpha, and then we can do learning with this meta-learned objective function um, also by a gradient descent. So this is gradient-based. And we have two phases in this approach, which is, which is meta-training and meta-testing, where um, uh, at meta-training time, we meta-learn these parameters alpha of the objective function. And you can think of it as many, many different agents across many different environments using this one objective function L alpha um, used as a learning algorithm, but at the same time also improving that learning algorithm such that they all get better and better at learning when they use this uh, L alpha as, as their reinforcement learning algorithm. So how do we improve this objective function, this learning algorithm? We start with some policy pi phi here and we update um, the phi's using our current objective function, which is initially just a randomly initialized neural network. We have this updated policy with phi tick, and we use a, a critic, like a Q function, to then judge uh, how good are these actions generated by the updated policy. And crucially here, this depends on alpha, which means that now we can take a second order gradient, or meta gradient as they often call it now, such that we can optimize the alpha of the objective function such that when we in the future apply this um, uh, learning algorithm, then we get an even better uh, policy according to this critic Q. And then after this meta training, we basically fix this objective function L alpha. So we fix our learning algorithm, we discard all our agents, and instead of using a human engineered learning algorithm, we just use that, um, yeah, that uh, meta learned learning algorithm in the form of the objective function. So what do we get from this? So meta testing means just applying this L alpha that we found during meta training. Um, and here, uh, the first thing we do is after having trained on uh, Luna Lander and half cheetah, we now test uh, different approaches. For instance, RL squared, which is a common meta learning baseline. And we observe that RL squared just overfits. It all immediately does well. Whereas meta general actually starts learning in this environment and gets better and better over time. And if you pick an objective function that works quite well in this particular environment, then you get to that uh, result even faster. But crucially now, what about outside the meta-training distribution? I have trained on uh, Lunar Land and Half Cheetah. Does it work on Hopper? And as we observed, yes, it does work. It actually implements a learning algorithm, whereas R squared just immediately overfit. And then we also compare to human engineered learning algorithms like um, reinforce on policy and off policy uh, and, and DDPG, and it often outperforms a lot of them, um, although DDPG is, is still quite competitive. Um, all right, so that is the first approach to meta learning, reinforcement learning algorithms. But the question is can we do this with fewer inductive biases? Like now we already still have gradient descent to learn, but what if we even want to learn that? Yes? Sorry, what was the best of objective function that you found? In terms of interpretability? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, there is a work which constrains these objective functions more. So if you talk with Chris Liu, for instance, 
such that you are in a, in a smaller subspace of learnable learning algorithm, then you can start to interpret what are, what are we actually meta learning here? Like how, what, how does this relate to PPO, for instance? But we're quite black box here, so we actually didn't really dive into interoperability in that room. But it's a good question. <laughs> okay, so um, if you think about what we've done so far, we basically did a gray box approach where learning at meta test time corresponds to the, taking gradient steps with this uh, meta learned objective function L alpha. And this leads to good generalization as we have seen. But maybe we want to do it with more black box. We don't even want to use gradient descent because maybe there's something better we can do than that. So that kind of work essentially is sort of known as meta recurrent neural networks or R squared and reinforcement learning um, from Hochreiter and Duan and Wang. Uh, and essentially you can think of it as in context learning from reinforcement learning. Um, sometimes it's also called memory based meta learning. So, how does, what does that look like? Essentially, you have a recurrent neural network or another black box model like a transformer, which um, implements the learning algorithm in its parameters. So essentially, you have uh, this unrolling of, of, your, um, you know, of your neural network, which is also the policy at the same time. So, so the recurrent neural network here, where you take as an input the current observation, like in said, I don't know, but you also take the reward as an input. So the, the, the crucial thing here really is that you have some feedback signal of how good is the policy doing at the moment, or it could be a demonstration, like a few examples of how the policy should be, uh, should be acting in that environment. Um, and then really uh, the learning algorithm is implemented in the dynamics of this RNN. So it receives rewards and it has new observations, and then uh, it can maximize these, these rewards internally by storing something in its activations to get better and better. Um, and the meta learning really just corresponds to chaining this of many, many episodes. You have an episodic RL problem um, and, and, and updating these parameters data such that they get better and better and learning faster and faster. So really maximizing the rewards or the return as quickly as possible. And meta testing then is really just unrolling this RNN. It, it just implements the learning algorithm in its dynamics. Now the problem is, Generalization is actually quite difficult with these. Um, and as we've seen with R squared in the previous slide, if you, if you don't train it across a really wide environment distribution, it just fails. So how can we um, take that into account and uh, yeah, define an architecture that actually uh, still generalizes? And one idea that we've been uh, working on uh, a while back is called variable shared meta learning. And here the idea really is instead of having one black box model like, a, like an LSTM, we just have many of those with many LSTMs and they all share the same parameters, but they have different states, which means you have a short description length because you have very few parameters, but you have really a big memory because the state is different across the LSTMs. And that leads to the generalization and we will talk about that. So we're now moving into the in-context learning territory, uh, which I like to think of like black box learning with uh, a little bit of inductive bias, like parameter sharing across these LSTMs. Uh, that, that's the meta learning backdrop and improving it. We're actually discussing this now in the supervised learning. So, um, one crucial insight in this paper was that in order to uh, meta learn good learning algorithms that generalize very well, you need a lot of memory in this network. Why is that? Because the memory needs to contain the learned policy, it right? needs to infer uh, how to act very, very well and store this in, in its memory. And the problem with RNNs is they don't have a lot of memory compared to the number of parameters. So you have n squared parameters, but only uh, open um, memory. So as you increase the memory, your parameters grow quadratically. And one way around this is to just have many of these LSTMs, but share the same parameters, as I, as I mentioned. And then you just pass messages between these uh, RNNs, essentially, just sending, sending activations between each other. So it's a bit like a graphing network. And that allows you for um, yeah, an arbitrary memory capacity increase because you can just add more LSTMs to it, but you don't increase the parameters. And it also allows to keep the description of the learning algorithm very small, which enables generalization. And one way to think about this is, is like sort of like a, um, a learning algorithm that is encoded in these neurons. So you can think of each, each LSTM like a neuron with a simple learning algorithm and all together they form like a, like a big, big learning algorithm. So why do I think this is a, a useful intuitive analogy? 
because just by arranging these LSTMs in a certain way, you can think of them as like uh, the weights of a neural network. So we have a standard neural network here. We have like endless images as an input and then uh, multiple layers. And what we do is instead of having weights here, we have these LSTMs. So we, we have the same system as before, but these LSTMs send messages to each other in a certain connectivity. And then you can interpret this whole thing just as a neural network where the state of the LSTMs is a weight and it updates um, uh, this weight with a learning algorithm encoded in these LSTMs. And you essentially have messages passing forward through the network from one layer uh, to the other. So in some sense, you can think of this as in-context learning, but you can also think this as learned weight updates or fast weights or hypernetworks. Right? They come in many names, but these things are all kind of the same from this lens of looking at it. You can just think as activations being weights in certain contexts. Uh, and of course, you need to pass information throughout the network, so also in the backward direction. So first you have this message going uh, forward in the network, this generates some outputs Y, but then of course there's uh, in the supervised learning some error at the outputs, which you move backwards to the network to the LSTMs again. So you have message passing sort of forth and back through the network. So what is in context learning then in this context? Basically the network receives some input image like this endless image here. Um, it produces some prediction. Then there's an arrow, how good was that prediction? And that arrow is fed back into the network at the next step together with a new image such that it makes another prediction. And the more of these images we see, the better it gets. So now the meta learning part is optimizing these RNN weights. And one cool experiment that we had is we actually showed that this thing by uh, 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 meta learning, the, these weights can actually implement backprop purely in the recurrent dynamics. So we really trained it to do backpropagation just by unrolling these LSTMs. So we didn't have to compute any explicit gradients anymore. Uh, it's sort of like a learning iron cloning, learning iron distillation procedure. There has been some recent work also of, of that in the reinforcement learning setting. Yes. The, the, how are you using the error? Uh, it's it's uh, just fed uh, into the LSTMs as an input. As like the backward pass? Or? Uh, they can be explicit forward backward passes, but they can also all communicate asynchronously with each other all the time. Both works, though asynchronously is a bit harder to meta learn. <clears throat> Yeah. And do you think the description length of that is less than just like the description length is like a suggestion of it being more general? Uh, is smaller than that of like just a backdrop? Like, uh, Ooh, compared to backdrop. Yeah. Uh, it's probably longer than that. Yeah. Because these are both these LSTM weights, but it's definitely shorter than just taking one LSTM or one transformer. Okay, sure. All right. So if, if, if you look at um, meta learning from scratch, so essentially just optimizing these parameters to make predictions as fast, as good as possible, we get these nice curves where we observe, we, we train it on that list, it actually um, yeah, learns a bit faster than um, backpropagation uh, with SGD or Adam. Um, but it does, of course, burst. And if you just take a single metric, and as you observe with a single metric, it immediately does the prediction well. So there's not really any learning happening. Um, but crucially, the generalization cases on a new data set here, like Flash List, you can still learn with this network by just unrolling it. And it does still does better than uh, these backprop SUD and Adam uh, variants, whereas the meta RNN just wouldn't generalize because it just overfitted the data set you traded on. So the with the short description length, there's a really strong generalization happening. Um, and all this happens without any gradients in meta test time. So we just encoded a, a new learning algorithm just in the weights of, of these RNNs. And it generalizes not just to new data sets, but you can really do fancy stuff with it. Of course, you could uh, change the number of classes. It's still pretty easy. You can just upscale and downscale. Um, the images just by adding more LSTMs or removing LSTMs in meta test time, uh, down scaling, but you can even shuffle them and it still works. So uh, it's actually not so important what that image looks exactly like. It's, it's a quite general uh, learning algorithm. And you can even just randomly project these and it still learns from these random projections to, to classify well. 
And in the paper, we have a few other data sets. Okay, um, just to mention it here, we've also done the similar things with a similar architecture in reinforcement learning, uh, but I will not go into this uh, into too much detail here because I want to talk uh, more about some transformer work, which uh, takes a bit of a different approach to this problem by really just blowing up the task distribution and just taking a standard transformer or other uh, black box uh, neural architecture to implement these very general purpose in context letters. So if you think about our spectrum again, checking the time, yeah. Uh, if you think about our spectrum again, where are we in this spectrum? Well, we are moving further and further to the side of less structure. So we're really at the black box end now, making very few assumptions uh, about our neural network architecture, um, but now really relying on the data distribution to get generalization. So just to think a bit about in-context learning and supervised learning, uh, what does that look like? So in supervised learning, you have uh, essentially a function, um, which um, is a function from a data set of uh, inputs xi, labels yi, um, and some query x tick that you want to predict on, mapping to the uh, prediction y tick for that query x tick. So you're essentially conditioning a classifier in this case on a data set. But of course, if you think about all these functions that, that, that uh, this uh, spans, not all of them are learning algorithms. There's a, a crucial uh, ingredient to a learning algorithm, which is that your predictions y tick improve the more examples you have, right? So example, for, if you have more analyst examples, you can make better predictions because you learn more about the data set. And that's essentially how we classify a, a learning algorithm in this context. And here we just use black box models like LCMs of all kinds of variants and transformers. So um, to implement this learning algorithm, we, we have a fairly vanilla transformer, which we call a general purpose in context learning transformer, but we then just feed in um, this data set as, as described in the function before and this query point and then make, let it make a prediction. And now the question is, at what point does such a black box model implement a learning algorithm um, and not just directly learn these uh, supervised learning problems you condition it on? And the hypothesis is that if you have a very, very um, diverse um, task distribution, then you get these general purpose in context learners. We, we've discovered some really interesting um, transitions that we'll talk about moving from one to the other. So now the question is, if you need these big task distributions, how, where do we get them from? It's not so easy, right? We, we only have so many data sets out there. But if, if we need to train across many of them, then maybe data augmentation is the way to go. And we have a very severe data augmentation for this, which is taking a base data set like MNIST here, and then creating lots of different tasks from that using linear, uh, random linear projections and random label permutations. So you can really think of like each task is a, is a, is a unique random projection and unique label permutation such that you can generate arbitrarily many of these tasks. And then you meta train across all of them at the same time uh, with a single prediction pattern. So what does this meta training objective look like? Uh, essentially, um, you have this expectation of a data sets, which you generate using these random projections, um, where you then have a loss, which is uh, the cross entropy loss here with any prefix of a data set. So any examples of input images and labels and a query point xj um, predicting uh, this yj. And then you do this over all prefixes of the sample data set. So it's, it's sequence prediction, essentially. And the question then is, what happens if you meta train um, with this specific objective, depending on many different factors? So the factors we looked at is the architecture, uh, the network capacity, and the number of tasks, and a few others. So we first talk about network capacity and number of tasks here. And there was one hypothesis that we had, which is that what we know from multitask learning is, if um, we have more and more capacity in the network, we can learn more tasks, like more classification tasks at once. So essentially, as the network capacity increases, the number of tasks you can learn also increases. But if you use a different model, like a transformer, where you condition on the data set, 
So each element in the sequence you condition on uh, comes, comes from the same task, so the same uh, linear projection, for instance. Then something interesting might happen where suddenly you go into a, a learning regime where you can seemingly generalize to an infinite uh, number of tasks um, as the uh, network capacity increases. So how do we verify this hypothesis? So we have this big matrix here with um, just an MLP, which takes one input image, x tick, and makes a prediction of what this y tick. And we have different hidden sizes of, uh, of this MLP. And then we have many different tasks. So really going all the way from two to the, uh, from one task to two to the 24 tasks. And these tasks are just random projections of that list. And um, as we can see here, that larger the uh, hidden capacity, um, the better uh, or the, the more of these tasks we can predict. So actually each cell is a separate training run where we observe that the accuracies are uh, high if you have enough capacity um, and uh, not too many tasks. You can fit more and more. But um, if we move over to um, transformers, then we see there's something interesting happening in the top right corner where if your transformer is big enough, then suddenly you can generalize to all of these tasks if you condition on this data set of task examples in the transformer. And uh, what we observed is that there's learning to learn happening in this corner at the top right. But of course, we still have to verify that, which we'll go into now. And uh, an interesting first uh, evidence for that is that in this top right corner, you can also generalize to unseen tasks. So if you run it on a projection, you haven't uh, trained on, then it also does well in that region. And we will talk about some interesting phase transition here, um, which is really seemingly quite abrupt and discrete. So how do we know that in this corner where suddenly we can learn um, across all of these tasks, learning to learn is, ha is happening? Well, we have to look at meta test time, where we just take the, near the transformer and we feed more uh, examples and more examples, right? So we make the, the data set it is conditioned on bigger and bigger. And we can see that um, when we train on MLIST, the more examples we feed, the better the accuracy gets. So um, it makes a prediction with just seeing one image, it's still quite bad. And the more it sees, the better the, the prediction on this last image gets. And uh, interestingly, it also generalizes um, to fashion MLIST here, where it wasn't even trained on. So we call this difference in like the first example and the last example, the learning or the within sequence improvement, right? Um, just getting better and better, the more examples it sees. Um, okay, so uh, I've talked about this phase transition, but what, what does this actually look like? Like, like how, how does this suddenly merge, right? Uh, and one, one particular interesting uh, experiment that we, we had here was looking at just this within sequence improvement that I just discussed and plotting it for different data sets um, with different numbers of tasks. So essentially here on the x-axis, we start with just one training across one task, going all the way to two, 24, uh, to two to the 24 tasks. And we look at how good is it on the endless data set that we uh, trained on with these random projections. How good is it on an unseen uh, random projection on MNIST? And how good is it on a completely different data set? So if you have few tasks, we are in the task normalization phase, as we observe, where uh, we have zero learning, zero within sequence improvement, as we plotted here. Um, but if you start having more tasks, then suddenly you can identify which task you're at um, just by observing parts of the data set and then uh, classifying according to that classifier stored in the transformer, which is evident as this increase in the um, uh, accuracy of our classifier uh, on seen projections, right? This blue line is going up, but the others stay down. So uh, that's the task identification phase. And then we move to the learning to learn phase where suddenly we can actually generalize uh, also to unseen uh, projections of endless or unseen fashion endless. So, so it seems like we really encoded a general purpose learning algorithm um, in this transformer just by training across sufficiently many tasks. Um, and this transition here, I think is super interesting because it's not really a smooth transition, but rather quite a abrupt change. 
So if we have multiple training runs across this like band of uh, two to the 14 number of tasks, then we see that um, what we learn is in two modes. Either the training loss is fairly high, which is, is like the, the, the top uh, region, or it drops down to this lower region of, uh, around training loss of 1.0, um, where it, it qualitatively behaves differently. So in this lower region, it does the general purpose learning to learn, where it generalizes to unseen endless and unseen fashion endless. But in this upper region, it still does, um, uh, it, it still ju just does task identification. And uh, when you have multiple training runs, it, it ends up in one of these modes, but it really is in between. Okay, so um, these are the insights about phase transitions. So maybe ask. any questions? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. How does memory affect when these curves turn up? Uh, yeah, oh, we will talk about it now. Yeah, <laughs> perfect question. <laughs> um, exactly. So, one interesting observation with these uh, large models was always about the number of parameters in the model, like the, the scaling loss leading to more and more capabilities. But we kind of uh, discovered that um, this sort of scaling law is not very predictive of in-context learning or general purpose learning to learn uh, in our setting, but rather the memory size is really predictive. So if you just think about the number of parameters of various architectures, we tried LSTMs, transformers, a variation of LSTMs with other products, which is like fast regulated, if that says anything to you. Um, but it, essentially, they all have different memory capacities. But um, we plotted all of them in terms of their parameters first. And we just looked at the accuracy of the last prediction after having seen 100 examples. Um, and we observed that as the parameter count increases, there's no, not a clear relationship here that the number of parameters is really crucial in terms of the learning to learn capability. But if we plot this against the state size, so you can think of this as um, the memory the transformer can access in terms of like uh, its, its key uh, value query mechanism to, to previous tokens um, or the hidden size of an LSTM, so essentially how much it can access uh, about the data set, then as this memory, the state size increases, our learning to learn capabilities get better, both on seen and unseen data sets. It is not a perfect prediction, but, but there's a, a clear trend here. So memory capacity really is, is, is very crucial and, and, and predictive of uh, in-context learning. And we think that maybe this uh, also applies to uh, other problems, uh, not just meta learning, but, but perhaps the success of transformers really relies a lot on this memory, this uh, state size capacity. Um, and, and that is one crucial aspect of transformers that make, make it work so well. Any questions? Still thinking yeah, about I'm, it? I'm, I don't understand why looking at the accuracy on a scene task and a scene data set tells you anything about how well you've learned to learn. I understand no, I, in scene task um, and scene data set. Well. That alone does not tell you that. You, you have to also look at the unseen one. That is yeah. correct. That is correct. Yes, it is true. I haven't plotted the unseen one um, for the very left one. Yeah, that's true. But for the memory size here, uh, as you increase the, the state size, you see the same yeah. trend within seed and unseed. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay. Another, yeah. Sorry, could you just spell out what the difference was between like the architectures here? So is it, yes, there's a different trade off between memory and the parameter count? Yeah, yeah, totally. So with, with LSTMs, I mean, we talked about that before, right? You have this linearly uh, increasing uh, uh, memory capacity with the hidden state and quadratically increasing parameter count. With the transformers, you can control the memory very well by um, increasing the key query value sizes. Um, and of course, the, the sequence length in a way, but we're looking at fixed sequence lengths here. Uh, and with the other product LSTMs, we actually have um, an, uh, the, the hidden state of the LSTM is, is, a, is an outer product in the sense that you produce two vectors, you, you outer product them, you do it over multiple steps, you just add up these outer products um, to, to create this like, uh, yeah, a matrix memory or this, this uh, fast weight memory. And then you just query it by um, yeah, reading it out using, using another uh, query from this uh, matrix to produce your prediction. And in that way, you 
get a fairly big memory, which you can also, uh, it's also quadratically uh, large com compared to just the linear, linearly sized one in LSTMs. Uh, and the, the variable shared meta learning work that I just discussed before, uh, you can also plot it here, right? Because we, we were able to increase the memory capacity arbitrarily using the, these parameter shared LSTMs. So that's also one way to just obtain more memory. In particular, here we looked at not having um, certain symmetries in, in, in this VSML architecture uh, in terms of, <laughs> I haven't really talked about this much here. Maybe for that, you have to refer to the paper for the details, but, but roughly speaking, um, we, before we apply these multiple LSTMs to the input, we actually randomly project the input as well. You, in that case, using a learned projection, like, yeah, so it's, it's a learned projection. And then in the end, you also have a, another learned projection to uh, disable some of these symmetries to compare it better, but it's a bit of a detail. The, the main insight here is that there's multiple architectures with different parameter counts, different memory sizes, and they somewhat follow the same trend in, in terms of memory size, predicting how well you can do in context learning. Okay, so how easy is, is meta optimization? That, that's a question that was quite dear to me because um, a lot about meta learning is fixing instabilities and like getting these outer loops actually to optimize the inner loop uh, in, a, in, a, in a stable way, like could be unstable training and there could be slow conversions. It could be local minima, lost plateaus. There's all kinds of problems that you can have. Um, and in particular, my previous work in variable shared meta-learning, meta-optimization could get quite difficult the deeper the network gets. Um, and also the number of parameters of these uh, LSTMs is, is quite small. So um, you're not really in the over-parameterization regime, which can also make uh, optimization more difficult. Um, in, in symmetric learning agents, which was the VSML in, in, um, in reinforcement learning, we also required increasingly large batch sizes in order to do this meta training to, to like really large scales. So there's a lot of things that you had to look at to, to make this uh, work. And you also need quite some scale in terms of batch sizes sometimes. And the question is, now with just using transformers in this really highly over-parameterized regime, do we, do we get around of some of these problems? And there's some interesting insights here because by default, it's actually not that easy but we have some cool fixes. So one thing we observed is that Manitarian dynamics often are in these, um, yeah, in these extended periods of a loss plateau where you're just stuck. So this is really a loss uh, curve here. We just make a little progress in the beginning and then you're stuck over a long time until then suddenly you learn uh, actually to learn. Um, and we're gonna look at this loss plateau a little bit more in detail. I think we haven't fully understood this phenomenon, but we have some, some interesting insights here. So if we zoom into this loss plateau, we actually observe it's not entirely flat. I mean, you're making some progress in there. And actually, the, if you look at different kinds of losses, the trading loss is increasing slightly in this plateau. But on unseen data sets, like fashion analysts and analysts, you're actually increasing. So it seems like you're overfitting to your task distribution a little bit, just a little bit. I mean, this is really tiny uh, differences, but there's a little bit of memorization happening. Um, so one intervention that we found in order to get around this uh, loss plateau, or essentially make this loss plateau shorter, is to increase the, the batch size. Um, so it seems that this high variance gradient that we have uh, are one reason why we are in this in this last plateau for some time. And we have this plot here where as you increase the, the task batch size and um, you have different numbers of tasks, you end up in three kinds of solutions at the end of training. Either you are stuck in the last plateau, which is at the top left, this green area, or you memorize this if you have uh, too few tasks, this is the orange area, or you end up generalizing and, and really find a general learning to learn uh, or learning algorithm. Um, Another way to look at this is, is, is sort of like a, this power law relationship between this, where um, the plateau length depends on your task batch size, and the number of tasks shift you up and down in, in this relationship. So if you increase your task batch size, your plateau gets shorter and shorter. 
or looked at in, a, in another way, the number of tasks, it also seems to be power law, where the last, last plateau um, uh, yeah, uh, gets longer the more uh, tasks you have. Probably because it's harder to fit all of these tasks with a, a general learning to learn a solution straight away. Um, and interestingly, one could think batch, just let's just increase the batch size, right? It seems to make the loss plateau shorter, that's a good solution. But it does rely on parallelizability, where the total number of tasks actually that you have to see actually increases. So as you increase the, the task batch size, the um, number of tasks that you see in the plateau gets longer, even though the plateau gets shorter, just by increasing this the task batch size. Okay, so maybe there's a different intervention we can uh, we can do. Um, one is changes in the meta optimizer. So we have the observation that gradient norms are very small um, in, in most layers, but the last mm -hmm. layer. And with Adam, usually gradients are rescaled, but actually the, the gradients were so small that uh, due to the epsilon in Adam, we were just clipping away the gradients uh, and the rescaling didn't really work very well. So one solution is just make this epsilon smaller and the loss plateau gets shorter. So uh, let Adam do its job in a way um, of rescaling these small uh, gradient norms. And you see it works, so, so we shift, as we uh, de decrease the epsilon, we, we shift down in terms of the plateau length, but there are also some instabilities happening now, numerical instabilities due to these small epsilons. So another um, solution is to just, let's discard the gradient magnitude altogether. It's called a sign optimizer, where we just keep the, the, um, the we apply the sign function to, to the expo exponentially moving average, and, and don't worry about the actual magnitude of the gradient, and follow that. That increases numerical stability and also shortens the loss plateau a lot. So that, that is also a solution. But the one I think is most insightful and cool is sort of like a curriculum. Essentially, you can bias your data distribution. So this relies on our uh, previous insight where in this loss plateau, we are memorizing a little bit and then suddenly generalize later on. Um, and we just want to magnify this effect. So we want to essentially increase in our batch, increase the things we can memorize, such that we first memorize and then generalize later on. And we do that by essentially increasing the frequencies of a few tasks in our batch um, by just using a, a fixed task or just fixing the label permutation, so, so, so making it a little easier to learn. Um, and now we, we can do this with different uh, fractions of the batch, essentially. We can bias our batch towards certain tasks more or less. So if we have 0% permuted label, so we, we, we don't randomize part of it such that it can, it can memorize certain uh, properties of the tasks early on, then we see that there's this, uh, yeah, this, this spike in the beginning where we're just memorizing, where on unseen fashion MNIST and, and, and unseen MNIST, we first do worse and then suddenly we do better. First memorizing a little bit and then we do better. But if you now bias um, the, uh, this, this batch by, by um, um, well, sorry, that is, that's the most biased version, yeah. And if, if you then bias it a little bit less to the 10% permuted labels, then we see that, um, yeah, essentially you, you uh, start to generalize uh, better. Um, because you have more randomization in your task distribution. But then if you move all the way to, to having no bias, you're back in the loss plateau. So essentially the more you bias your batch, um, the faster you can learn. And there's a sweet spot where you bias it just a little bit, 10% or 90%, um, where um, you, you can first memorize and then generalize um, where the 10% the here seems to completely avoid the loss plateau by just generalizing, generalizing quickly. Yeah. Uh, what architecture are these graphs over? These are all transformers. Okay. So, yeah. I, sorry, I didn't quite understand the intuition why memorization helps later for generalization. It, it essentially moves you away from this last plateau. So, if we, oops. Um, it, the, the observation here was that in this last plateau, the training loss is, is in, decreasing only uh, slightly. And at the same time, your, your loss on unseen data sets is increasing. So maybe there's just a, a slow process of memorization that if we could speed up this memorization, we could skip the whole last plateau. 
Um, so we want to we want to make this memorization happen faster. We want to actually have it memorize things before it generalizes by biasing our batch, by making some tasks more frequent, or at least um, removing some of these random permutations at the labels to 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 allow it to memorize something first. Right. Yes, I understood. Like, mm -hmm. if I take a look at the data, that that would make sense. But I just understand why that happens. Uh, um, why memorization is helpful, or why you are the last two exists in the first place? Why? Why? What exactly? Um, memorizing. Yeah, like the, regarding the like shift in uh, from memorization and generalization. Uh -huh. Like a good phase transition. Like. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a difficult like, question. I'm also not yeah. sure, to be honest, why this phase transition happens there. It's, it's more like an observation yeah, that this memorization effect helps. Yeah. Um, Do you see the transitions in our terms as well? Um, it's a good question. Uh, yes. yes, they happen a bit at different points in, term, in terms of number of tasks. But they do we something. haven't fully studied them in as much detail, so I'm a little bit careful there to, to answer that definitely. <laughs> so we mostly studied this in transformers. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Th this trick of, of biasing the air distribution definitely also out there. But, but while I think these effects are related, they're also um, a, little, a little bit different from each other. So one, one was about this phase transition of like, um, training across different numbers of tasks, right? Being in this task identification or general learning to learn phase. The other one here is about within one training run, what, uh, how, how easy it is to match optimize, how long are you in the loss plateau and when, when do you start generalizing? Right, but uh, the point at which you go over the plateau, yeah. you have learned to learn, right? That's right, yes. Okay, cool. yeah. Which so that, got, yeah. Sorry, the, um, well, there's a different question, but the, the curriculum itself is, it's not adaptive during the course of training, right? It's like you, you basically a priori uh, decide on a, on a fraction of these yeah. kind of tasks, right? It's not like choosing during training, maybe during training at some point, other some tasks become maybe should be more interesting to now look at than, than early in training, but you, it's not adaptive in that way, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. One could also make it adaptive, um, but we haven't done that. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it tells us something about curriculums being useful uh, in, in managing these learning dynamics. Yeah. Right. Have you considered, uh, are your networks under or over parameterized relative to the number of tasks that you have? Because it feels like you have more um, data and you have more tasks, right? So, so what we've observed is, I mean, we're learning very general learning algorithms here, which you could express with a, a lot fewer parameters, like in the value shared meta learning case, right? Yeah. Very small SDNs were fine with just 10,000 parameters. Whereas here we have you know, up to millions of parameters. And which means what we're actually learning is quite simple, right? It's a very general, simple learning algorithm, but we over parameterize it heavily. Um, and with this biasing or some of these other interventions that, that we've seen, um, we can actually make use of this over parameterization to make meta learning, meta optimization easier. And how does this relate also with like the memory size you talked like before, like this uh, uh, biasing? Like if you increase or decrease the like the, the size, of, like the memory size, for example, the transformer. How does this uh, plateau uh, in this case with the permitted labels change? Um, it's a good question. We haven't looked at it in detail. Okay, so this model is over parameterized. You said though. In, in terms of the number of parameters, yes. Yeah. The, the, so so these plots we haven't looked at. Um, in, in terms of the memory capacity, or in terms of the number of parameters. Okay. So I like suppose like if you first have a lower memory capacity, and then how, like, um, there are some methods that you can increase the memory capacity of a model while still kind of keeping the same function approximate. Yeah. It could lead to the plateau being, uh, um, so this generalization happens sooner, possibly, because if the, the model is very large, a lot of memory, Will take like this plateau is definitely going to be longer. Like, hmm. I have to think about it a bit offline. I'm not entirely sure right now 
but that is to be expected. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we haven't really run that concretely, so I at least cannot give you empirical evidence. I'm not sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Do you want to comment on how this is related or not related to cropping? Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. This was a question we thought about for a long time during this work. And I, I think our conclusion is it, it's not really grokking, um, but we're not sure. <laughs> so, because in grokking, they found that a larger batch size also helped. Uh, and there seems to be some similarities, but yeah. Maybe it's just transformers and they have like this cascade of emergency, emergent qualities. Yes. Let me get back to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last question. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is outside of, uh, of the scope of this work, but do you have any intuition of whether this phenomenon would exist in green post like, From, from my experience, out. similar things are happening. Right. <laughs> whether this is the exact same effect. I'm not sure, but I, I, um, I could imagine that there's something similar happening here. And in, in reinforcement learning, you need even larger batch sizes because your signal is inherently higher variance, or more noisy. Um, so it just makes it more difficult. And maybe that's another reason why curricula would it there. Okay, so just to give you a little idea, comparing it to other methods, we're running a little bit short on time now. So um, essentially we just method trained on MNIST here and then tested it on, on different uh, data sets and compared these general purpose and context learners to different variants like LSTMs. Um, they do much better than LSTMs due to the memory capacity size. Uh, compared to SGD, so it's actually quite comparable to SGD across these data sets, even on the unseen ones. Get rid of this, so, oh. oh, okay, you have to go, yeah, <laughs> see ya. Um, and uh, on C410, we observe it's not doing so well yet. Why might that be? Um, okay, we also go back to Mabo, yeah, and some previous work. So on C410, we're doing this with 100 examples. And if you think about CIFAR 10, we need a lot of examples to actually learn CIFAR 10. It's a big data set. So with 100 examples, it's a too difficult data set to learn, which suggests that we need longer sequences, longer in context learning in order to also handle these data sets. And we've done some experiments which show that as you increase the sequence, it's getting better and better. So I think there's reason to believe that this, uh, if we can do longer uh, sequences, then we can also generalize to these uh, more complicated data sets. But there's also another way to go about this, which is, well, maybe we don't want just general purpose learning algorithms, but we also want domain specific learning if we have seen something like that task before. So one idea is to just use uh, pre-trained networks that, as embeddings. So we take like a CIFAR 10 classifier, or ImageNet, sorry, ImageNet classifier here, um, and just chop off the last few layers, just take the, few, the, the first few layers, and then transform all our data sets into that latent space. And um, then just run the same procedure on top of that. So also do your randomizations, meta train on that, and then see how it generalizes to different data sets. And we see that this actually allows you to learn much faster. So um, while we only meta train on MDIST, we can then, using these uh, pre-trained feature embeddings, generalize to all of these other data sets still. So we still have a very general purpose learning algorithm, but um, um, it can now actually learn on CIFAR 10 and SVHN much faster. So that could also be an interesting uh, future research direction, like combining domain-specific and uh, general purpose learning. Another question that is uh, that comes up, of course, is are these random projections the right way to do it? This is just a way to look at these things and analyze them and get some cool general purpose learning algorithms, but maybe there's better ways to do this, right? Maybe you can generate new tasks from scratch or augment existing data sets in different ways, or we can just collect more data sets that said, we've observed we need two to the 13, two to the, two to the 14 numbers of tasks, so that might be really hard. Um, 
So that's definitely an interesting future research question. And uh, moving this to reinforcement learning, of course, is also super interesting. Uh, what kind of reinforcement learning algorithms can we discover that are really general purpose using this uh, wide task distributions? All right, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up and thanks a lot. <laughs>